Okay, that helps. Okay, there we are. Okay, good. <laughs> Okay, so um, Bhante Sujato has just been talking about the, the timeline of Buddhism, the, uh, the dates of the Buddha, the dates of Ashoka, etc. And he also mentions the first schism, the Mahasangika schism, about 150 years uh, BC. Yeah. So from that, uh, the second, you know, the next thing that comes after that is the basic division of Buddhism into different schools. So that's the next kind of important event. Uh, and this is actually a very important event. Uh, let me just bring it up first of all. Yeah, there we are. Okay, yeah. And this is actually quite important, this idea of different schools in Buddhism, because uh, once we start to understand the division into schools, start to understand the, uh, the doctrines of the different schools and how they actually expanded around the world, uh, then we start to understand the textual basis that is available today for scholarly research. And this is uh, the basis that is used today for doing things like comparative studies, uh, which I will talk about later on. So this whole, to have some grasp, some idea of the early schools is actually quite important for uh, understanding of the early Buddhist teachings. Uh, so uh, we see here that there were 18 uh, early schools, uh, so-called. These are kind of the traditional 18 schools. Uh, it, you know, whether how many schools there actually were is a bit uncertain. Uh, uh, but anyway, there's only a few of these schools that actually are important for us today. Uh, and obviously, very important is the Theravada school. Uh, uh, and uh, that is a school that went to Sri Lanka. Now, this all started off really at the time of Ashoka. Uh, if you read uh, uh, the chronicles in Sri Lanka, known as the Mahavangsa and Deepavangsa, there are stories about the spread uh, of the various uh, of Theravada school in particular. Uh, and it talks about how, at the time of Ashoka, there were like, a missionary called the Arahant Mahinda was sent to Sri Lanka to convert Sri Lanka to Buddhism. So this is basically written in uh, the Sri Lankan chronicles, uh, and they were written in Sri Lanka. But this remarkably enough, coincides very well also with inscriptions in India. And some of the most important inscriptions in India, as Bhante Sujata was mentioning before, are the Ashokan pillars. And the Ashokan pillars talk about the Dhamma Dutta, sending out the missionaries to various parts of India, including Sri Lanka, and also the Mahamattas, which were like ministers of religion, so to speak, almost quite literally ministers of religion. And this is spoken about in the Ashokan pillars. And then you also have other inscriptional evidence at some of the great stupas in Sri Lanka, uh, in India, this famous stupa at Sanchi, where there's found inscriptional evidence of this missionary movement that actually happened at the time of Ashoka. So this seems to be historically very solidly based, this idea of a missionary activity. And one result of that was the uh, conversion of Sri Lanka to Buddhism. And that then became the Theravada school, sometimes known as the Mahavihara Vasins. And they had the headquarters then in, in Sri Lanka. And that's where they uh, produced all the later texts, you know, that we know today as part of the Pali Canon. And that's where they also... Uh, kept and safeguarded the Pali Canon for the centuries afterwards. So that is one kind of extreme, way, way to the south. They also probably had other parts of India where they had um, a kind of monasteries or places where they actually were part of the Theravadan schools. It wasn't just in Sri Lanka, the other places as well, where they would have met, where they would have kind of uh, worked with other schools of Buddhism. But Sri Lanka was the main headquarters and then uh, uh, part of this missionary activity was not just the conversion of Sri Lanka, but it was also the movement north uh, into India. <coughs> and in particular, the one, uh, one of the most important schools that was established in the north of India was the Sarvasti Vadan school, which is the second school you can see up here. Uh, and they were established in what today is roughly the area of Kashmir. Uh, so I should actually probably find a map of all this because it gets hard to maybe to know what we're talking about. But Kashmir is obviously the very north of India, right? Sri Lanka is the very south. So they became established there, uh, probably again as a consequence of the missionary movement. Of course, in reality, things are much more complex than just one missionary activity. Uh, but that's kind of a nice, easy way of looking at it. Uh, and then you had uh, another important school that was established not far from Kashmir in Gandhara. Uh, and Gandhara is the area which today is in Pakistan and Afghanistan. And it's again slightly east 
sorry, west of Kashmir uh, in, in that particular area. This was a Dharmaguptaka school. Uh, and originally, these were kind of just movements, uh, and over time, there were kind of developments, presumably, uh, in doctrine, which actually made them into separate schools. Uh. So, if you, uh, there were also other schools that have, I mentioned here, you have the Mula Savastivadans. Uh, they also, at the later stage, were uh, quite strong in Kashmir, north of India. You have the Mahasangika. Uh, an important school because it was part of the first, uh, known as the first schism uh, with the Theravadas. Uh, uh, they were strong usually in central India, around the uh, origin places of Buddhism, like Magadha and these places. Uh, and the Mahishasaka, uh, to be honest, I don't know exactly where they, where they were strong, but they obviously were somewhere in, uh, in India. Avanti, uh, okay, the Avanti area. We'll talk more about that later on. Uh, but maybe we should see if we can find a map here. There is a map here somewhere. Uh, which says something about the, that, and that there is a fairly good map. So let's see if I can get the cursor roughly where we are. So this A over here, that's roughly the home area of the Buddha, where the Buddha started off teaching. Can you see that? You can see that, good, okay. So that is the, um, where Buddhism basically started out. This is where the Buddha you know, wandered around, this tiny little area up here, basically, here, something like that. Uh, and then Ashoka's capital was also over here. And then the missionary movement started from roughly over here in Avanti. That's where it's, it's said to have started out. And then part of that missionary activity then went down south to Sri Lanka. And part of it went north into the north of India, this part up here, which is the Kashmir area. And then you have Gandhara over here. This is where the Dharmaguptakas were. And the importance of this, in part, is because just north here, just north of this area, you have the ancient Silk Route, right? Uh, the Silk Route was a famous trader that went from all the way from uh, the Middle East over here, uh, and even into Europe, actually, uh, uh, later on, uh, and then all the way over to China. This was an ancient trade route between the, between the Middle East and China. Uh, and because it was an ancient trade route, uh, and because it was very close to where the Sarvastivadin and the Dharmaguptakas were based, uh, it was natural for monks to kind of hitch rides, right, uh, with the... Uh, uh, the caravans or whatever traveled on this route and went into China. Uh, and because they were hitch, ride, hitch rides, uh, because they were intent on expanding Buddhism or whatever, uh, they would actually have settlements in this part up here. This is called Central Asia, in this part up here. Uh, so with lots of Buddhist people in this part called Central Asia. And gradually it would move east, uh, further and further east, until it entered China. And the entry into China was started around the, the year zero, roughly, uh, in the Christian era. Uh, so just to give you some idea, and then gradually it moved into China, further and further into China, until eventually it reached the ancient capital of, of China, which was over here somewhere, uh, called Xi'an, uh, uh, and also Luoyang, which also was an no ancient capital, uh, uh, over into in, in uh, central China, that, that direction roughly. So let's see if I can find my way back to where I was. Uh, this is hazardous to move away, but okay. <laughs> so there we are. So that so those. So you get some idea now of the vast spread of the schools, right? Uh, if you take a ruler and you measure the distance from Sri Lanka to Kashmir, it's about 3,000 kilometers in a straight line. 3,000 kilometers, right? Uh, so vast distances. Uh, and what that meant was that these communities were quite isolated from each other. Uh, the doctrinal developments you found in Sri Lanka were quite isolated from the doctrinal developments you had in Kashmir. Uh, so they tended to move in slightly different directions. And that's how you got these different schools basically arising. Uh, from that particular, uh, because of those vast distances. There wasn't any communication possible, really, uh, when you had to walk. Okay, so let's see then the consequences of this. Okay, so the consequences of this is that in Sri Lanka, uh, uh, we have the Pali uh, Buddhist texts, uh, uh, and they developed then completely independently of much of the other Buddhist texts. Each of these schools would then have their own set of Buddhist texts, essentially. And then in China, as a consequence of the movement of Buddhist monastics into China, you got the translation into Chinese of uh, Buddhist texts as well. And these then would be the Sarvastivadin texts, right? Uh, because the Sarvastivadins were in north of India. Uh, it was easy for them to go into China. That's why the Sarvastivadin texts become very strong uh, in the Chinese uh, Tripitaka. Uh, not only the Sarvastivadins. Uh, uh, in China, you also have the uh, Dharmaguptakas are quite strong as well. Uh, they were in Gandhara, right? Again, to the north. Uh, 
And also in the Chinese Tripitaka, you find all kinds of school, schools basically represented in the Chinese Tripitaka. So the Chinese Tripitaka is a very different beast from the Pala Tripitaka. The Pala Tripitaka is basically one school with one teaching that was handed down in one place. In China, on the other hand, what you had, you had different missionary monks, different people coming into China. And because there wasn't any unified movement, you got all these fragments of different schools. And that's why you have a large number of schools represented in the Chinese Tripitaka. It's very, very different type of text than the Pali, Pali Tripitaka, Tipitaka. So that was the Chinese. I can maybe talk a little bit afterwards about how this actually happened. It's quite fascinating how the translation process happened into Chinese. Then you have, so that started around the year, the first century AD. It was when the very first translations were made into Chinese. Then you have the uh, Tibetan text. Now, Buddhism came to Tibet much, much later on. Uh, I think the very the first kind of starting point was about the 8th century when, when Buddhism started to go into Tibet. So because it is so late, it's, it's quite strange in a sense because Tibet is almost like between India and China, right? Despite that, it actually came to Tibet much, much later than China because it was difficult. We couldn't cross the mountains, hard to get into Tibet. So it had to kind of go you know, backwards in a sense before it actually got into Tibet. So only around the 8th century did it go into Tibet. And because it was so late, uh, the, the uh, Indian Buddhism had changed enormously in the intervening centuries. So the core Buddhism that existed in India from you know time of the Buddha, 5th century uh, BC, uh, had then gone through this enormous metamorphosis. Uh, Mahayana Buddhism arising in the 1st century AD. Uh, and then we had the Tantra schools arising maybe around the 5th or 6th century uh, AD. Uh. So because of that, the texts that they have in Tibetan are very different uh, from the text that you have in either Chinese or that you have in the Theravada school. So their the emphasis is much more on Mahayana suttas, on tantric things, a big lot of influence from Hinduism, etc. And very, very few, surprisingly few, early Buddhist texts actually find in the Tibetan scriptures, the Tibetan Tripitaka. Then you also have other languages in which the uh, Tripitaka was translated. It became translated into Sanskrit at some, in, in certain schools, uh, because Sanskrit was a very uh, kind of considered very elevated cultural language in India at the time, very high profile language. Uh, so people wanted to have the Tripitaka in Sanskrit. It kind of gave prestige to Buddhism, right? Everything is about prestige in our world. Uh, unfortunately, that's the way it is. Uh, so they wanted the prestige to have it in Sanskrit, uh, because that was the uh, uh, the, lit the literary language in those, in those days. Uh, so you find certain fragments in Sanskrit. Most of these have been kind of dug out of the deserts in uh, uh, places like, again, Kashmir, Gandhara, Pakistan, Afghanistan, uh, because that they had a very dry climate in that area. Because of the dry climate, desert-like conditions, uh, these scriptures tend to last a very long time. You dig them down in an urn, uh, they sit in a desert for 2,000 years, uh, you take them out, uh, and no, they're not exactly as they, as they were uh, before, but they, they can be with lots of care and lots of uh, um, skill in, in, you know, in kind of unrolling these um, uh, scriptures. You're actually able to, uh, to read them, these very ancient scriptures. Some of these Sanskrit scriptures we have today go, to, go back 2,000 years. Uh, 2,000 years old are these actual, some of these manuscripts. Uh, and you can imagine how fragile they are after having sitting in the desert for 2,000 years. Uh, and then you also have uh, Buddhist scriptures in many other languages. Uh, in English, I was going to say, but that, that doesn't really count. We're looking about the ancient scriptures now. Uh, and because the area in which it was uh, it suffused, you know, the Central Asian area, for example, there's lots of different groups of people and languages in Central Asia. And each one of these groups would have certain scriptures translated into that language. Things like Uyghur. Uyghur is kind of East uh, West Chinese uh, group of people, Khotani is another West Chinese group, Sogdian, uh, uh, I think it's a language called Tokarian, etc., etc. There's a large number of languages. And scriptures exist to this day in these languages, uh, and there are experts in every single group of these things. Uh. And then, of course, we have the archaeology uh, uh, around the time of Ashoka in particular, and Bantu Sujata mentioned this before. Uh, there are mentions in the 
uh, Ashokan inscriptions of specific suttas. So we know that some of these suttas existed at the time of Ashoka direct, with, through direct evidence. Okay, so let's uh, move on. Oops, that was, was it the wrong one? Left click. Left click? Okay, no. How do I go up? Yeah. What do we have? What happened to the Pali? Pali one, Pali scriptures. They used to be in there. Disappeared. <laughs> yeah, Pali can has gone there, okay. Yeah, see, it's not there. I'm not sure what happened to it. Anyway. <laughs> okay, so the Pali can has disappeared. That's a bit unfortunate. It's supposed to keep the Pali can. That's what we've been doing for two and a half thousand years. Yeah. <laughs> we're trying for desperately for two and a half thousand years to keep the Pali can. <laughs> Anyway, I'll, I'll talk a bit about the Pali Canon. We don't really need a slide because it's fairly, it's fairly, fairly straightforward, I think. Yeah. So we have the, when it comes to the, the Pali, you have, there's a large, large number of scriptures in the Pali and it can fill several shelves. I think about three or four meters easily if you take all the Pali uh, scriptures that we have. Uh, and a small portion of that is the Pali Canon. That's a Titi Pitika, right? Uh, the Abhidhamma Pitika, the Sutta Pitika, and the Vinaya Pitika. That's a small part of it. The rest of it uh, is other stuff. It's commentaries, sub-commentaries, uh, with Sudhi Maggas, uh, tracts on, uh, on Vinaya, on monks' discipline, tracts on Abhidhamma, uh, medicinal tracts. There's just everything. There's lots and lots of stuff in there. So the very first thing you do, to, if you want to find out what the most ancient scriptures are, is, of course, to go to the Tipitika, right? Uh, that is called the Tipitika for a reason, uh, because it's supposed to contain the word of the Buddha. That everything else is later, that's, that's uncontroversial, that's basically agreed upon by pretty much everybody. A commentary must be later than the, than the work that it actually comments on, right? It's just not logical, it makes very good sense. So once we have uh, winnowed, winnowed it down to the Tipitika, then what is this Tipitika? Now the first part of the Tipitika is the Vinaya Pitika. The Vinaya Pitika Okay, you will show? Okay, so Bhante uh, Sudrata is going to show you while we go through this. So the Vinaya Pitika is the discipline of the monk. So he's going to show you over there what it is. Uh, so that's those five, five volumes there. That's the Vinaya Pitika. <laughs> okay. Now that Vinaya, in that Vinaya Pitika, you find the following works. You find the, uh, the Patimoka Sutras, the Patimokas are the main rules for the uh, bhikkhus and also the bhikkhunis. Uh, and they are in there together with the commentary, the earliest commentary, which explains how those rules basically work. Uh. So that's two of those volumes, is that. Uh, and then another two volumes are like lesser rules, and there are also things like how to perform ceremonies, how to perform uh, official things within Buddhism, like you know, how do you ordain somebody, how do you punish an errant monk, you know, how, do you, how do you expel him from the monastery, that sort of thing. Yeah. And there are procedures for these things. These are legal documents, right? very clear procedures. And if you don't follow the procedure in the right way, if you don't do the right thing, just like in law today, it's invalid, you can't do it. For example, you can't punish somebody unless they confess to the fact that they've done something wrong. You can't punish somebody if they're absent, right? Etc., etc. It's a very high legal standard in these particular documents. So you can't really mess around too much. If you don't follow those standards, it's invalid. The fifth book of the Vinaya is a later book. Again, this is agreed on by most scholars. So even now, even within the Tipitaka, there's a clear, you can start to see the delineation of different chronology of when they were written, where they come from. The part from the Buddha is a small part, and the other stuff is, uh, is, also, is also already been included in the Pitaka itself. Then, uh, once you have the uh, Vinaya Pitaka, the next one is the Sutta Pitaka. So this is supposed to be the word of the Buddha. So we have there the Diga Nikaya, what he holds in his hands now. This is the long discourses of the Buddha. Uh, and then we have the Middle length discourse is coming next, the next three volumes over there. Huh? Middle length discourse of the Buddha, right? Uh, it's amazing how much he said in those years, actually, when you start looking at it. Uh, lots of volumes there. The next five volumes are the Sangyutta Nikaya, these are the connected discourses. Uh, 
Sang you Danica? Yeah. yeah. So you've got a lot of homework there for, for all of you. Yeah. <laughs> and then we have the uh, uh, Angutra Nikaya. This is the numerical discourses of the Buddha. The next five volumes again. Yeah. N- numerical, not, not miracle. No, no, not miracle. Yeah. N- numerical. Because they're classified according to numbers, that's why. Yeah. Angutra Nikaya. Yeah. So those are the four main collections. And then we have, uh, of all paradoxes in the world, the, the next one is the biggest collection of all. It's called the small collection. Uh, it's called the Kudaka, Kudaka Nikaya. This is a very kind of Buddhist thing. We've only taken out uh, some of the volumes over there. Uh, so that is only part of it. This is like the most ancient part of the Kudaka Nikaya. And then if you want to see the, if you see the big stack on the floor over there, uh, that's the rest of the Kudaka Nikaya. So you can see this small collection indeed. It's, it's bigger than... <laughs> Sorry? No, no, the big one is the Kudaka Nikaya. Yeah, I have divided it specifically for this purpose. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> okay. So these are then the texts of early Buddhism. And those things you see on the table there, uh, as far as the suttas are concerned, this is the earliest material in, uh, in the Pali Canon here. Then, last of all, we have the Abhidhamma Pitaka, and that is like a systematization of the Buddhist teachings. Uh, and that is the small stack you can see over there, the seven volumes of the Abhidhamma Pitaka. It's actually more than seven, because some of the books are divided. Uh, but there are seven books of the Abhidhamma Pitaka. And the Abhidhamma Pitaka is a systematization of the Buddha's teachings. It's a very kind of dry and very, very different in nature from the sutta. It's not really the Buddha speaking anymore. What you have now is some unknown person speaking and just basically stating things. This is the way, you know, it doesn't even say that. It just starts listing stuff from, from page one. It's a very different feel to it. Um, yeah, it's not even. It's more like philosophy. It's like kind of dividing things up into man, analyzing things and, and putting them together again and showing how they interrelate and all those kind of things. That's what the Abhidhamma is about. Not so much standard as such, I think. Yeah. Okay. So that is the Pali Tipitaka. Danya. Yeah. How it got in there. Huh? Yeah. Well, you remember in the early days, all they really had were the suttas of the Buddha, right? They didn't have anything else. So when somebody started making, making up something new, they had to decide where shall we put it. So instead of actually putting it in with the suttas, that was a good thing already, they created a new pitaka, which they call the, what they call the third pitaka. That became the Abhidhamma pitaka. And in the early days, I'm sure that was very controversial. But after a while, it, this also became known as the word of the Buddha after a while. But there are very good reasons for thinking that it's not the word of the Buddha, but I'll, I'll get back to that later on. Huh? Yeah. But, yes? Yeah. In, in a very limited sense, it can be called psychology. It's psychology in the way that it divides up the mind into different kind of aspects and that sort of thing. And it also talks about causality. But it's not really psychology so much in the modern sense of psychology, I think, yeah. But it is a type of psychology uh, or philosophy. That's true. Uh, yeah. Ed, Eddie, yeah. Why is Troy Academy? I find Abhidhamma so interesting. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Good. Yeah. 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 Is it? Yeah. Is that, is that your. Yeah, okay. Yeah. It is certainly related to it. It has to be related to it. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. All we're saying. So all we're saying now is that there are these three pitakas, right? Three different pitakas. And later on, I'll get back to the the timing. I'll talk a little bit about them, etc. But before we do anything, well, let's do a little bit of meditation. <laughs> Okay, so let's, uh, let's start again. Okay, so that was then the Pali Canon, as it is known, or the Pali Suttas, uh, or the Pali Scriptures, if you like. Uh, now let us have a quick look at the Chinese Canon. So this is the uh, Tripitaka, which exists in China. Uh, 
And uh, as it says here, one of the earliest translations was by a monk called An Shi Gao. Uh, this monk was not a Chinese person. It may look like it was Chinese when you see the name there. This is actually just a Chinese transliteration of a name of a monk who came from Par Parthia. Parthia was a kingdom, ancient uh, Central Asian kingdom, which exist, uh, existed rather uh, in the area, very um, in the corner, sort of between what is today Iran and Afghanistan, the, roughly that area. That was part. That was where he is from, uh, and he would then have travelled along the Silk Road, uh, would have arrived in China, uh, and then he started. He, I'm not sure whether he learned Chinese himself uh, or whether he translated it uh, with the help of others, uh, but he was one of the first translators. Uh, Actually, there were translations before him as well. Uh, uh, the very first translations go back to about year 30 or 40 uh, AD, so they quite, uh, go back a long way. Uh, but they were very kind of um, uh, odd translation. One translation here, one translation there. No, we don't really know much about the background for those translations. Anshiga was one of the first main translators. Uh, he, was quite, he was quite important. Uh, and that is kind of when the translation into Chinese took off, and it continued uh, throughout the second century, uh, the third century, things started to increase. Uh, some of the agamas, remember the agamas, they are the equivalent in the Sanskrit and the Chinese tradition to the Nikayas and the Pali. Uh, some of them were translated in the fourth century, and a large part of them were translated in the first half of the fifth century. That's why you have here most translations at, at that time. Uh, and one of the main translators there was another Indian person of Indian origin called Kumarajiva was one of the main translators at that time. And then later on, the, the Chinese themselves started to become, uh, started to translate. Uh, Shuang Tsang was one of the most important ones. Uh, he actually went to India and brought scriptures back to China and then translated. And these were the two modes in which translation happened into Chinese. Either you would have uh, monks uh, of uh, a Central Asian or Indian origin coming to China during the translations, or uh, you had Chinese pilgrims going to India, collecting scriptures, bringing them back to China, and then translating them. Uh, and this translation business is quite involved. You'd be surprised how these things happened. So usually the way it happened would be that you had this Central Asian or Indian monk coming into China, uh, and then he would gather a team of people around him, uh, and one would be the translator into Chinese, would be obviously had to be a Chinese person, right? Uh, then you would have scribe, uh, scribes who would, who would actually write down what was being said, uh, and then you would have people who corrected the scribes. Uh, so often you had a team of at least four people together uh, doing the translations into Chinese. Uh, so the Indian monk would recite, and often they would recite from memory, right? Uh, recite from memory the text as it was in Sanskrit, uh, or uh, Prakrit. Prakrit are the kind of um, the, um, uh, the, the local languages in India at the time. Uh, and then they would recite from memory. Then the Chinese person would translate into Chinese. The scribe would write down what the Chinese translator said. And then somebody would correct again what he said afterwards. That's how it actually happened. And you can see there's quite a bit of room for error there, right? It's very easy to get some of these things wrong. If your memory uh, misses something slightly, and the memory is always fallible, you're always going to make mistakes. Uh, or if a translation isn't good enough or whatever, uh, there's going to be mistakes. Uh, and for that reason, when you compare some of the Chinese suttas today with the Pali, you see those discrepancies. Uh, 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 part, in part, that would be because of translation problems, but also there are many other reasons as well. Uh. So, uh, the suttas that were translated into Chinese are known as the Dirg Agama. Dirg Agama is the equivalent to the Diga Nikaya in Pali. Uh, and that Dirg Agama belonged to the Dharma Guptaka school. The Dharma Guptaka school, remember, was one of the schools in north of India, right? And the Dirg Agama came to China uh, through that um, somehow. Uh, with these people traveling across. You have the Madhyama Agama, Sangyukt Agama, and these, of course, uh, are parallels to the Majjhima Nikaya and Sangyutta Nikaya in Pali, uh, and these belong to the Sarvastivadan school, uh, right? Uh, and you have the Ekotra Agama. Ekotra Agama, nobody knows exactly which school it belongs to. It hasn't really been analyzed in enough detail yet, uh, but it clearly is the parallel to the Chinese Angutra Nikaya. Uh, 
So you can see here, they belong to different schools, right? It's not as simple as with the Pali, everything belongs to the same school. Uh, they belong to different schools. Uh, and because of that, the comparison is actually quite difficult. Uh, sometimes it looks like a sutta is missing in the Chinese, but we have it in Pali. Sometimes the other way around. Uh, but because uh, they belong to different schools, it's actually very difficult to know uh, what existed in each school prior, previously to that. It gets quite complicated. And then you have also all kind of other material. You have partial translations of the Sangyukta Agama, two partial translations. You have a partial translation of the Ekotra Agama, and you also have lots of individual suttas uh, which have been translated into Chinese. So it's a very kind of what you would call heterodox um, collection of suttas. It's not very uh, kind of uniform in any way at all. Uh. And this is even more clear when you come to the Vinaya. There are five complete Vinayas in the Chinese, right? So, you have, so which one should you choose? It gets complicated. In Pali, it's very simple. You have one Vinaya. Chinese, you have five different Vinayas, which is very useful today because it means you can do comparative studies. You can compare all the Vinayas. You can find out what they have in common and what is different with these things. Well, you also have five different sets of loopholes, if that's what you're looking for. Okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's, that comes in very handy. Some people are expert in loopholes in the Vinaya, so that is, uh, that's true. Uh, and then you have the Abhidhamma books, and there are seven books of the Sarvastivadan Abhidhamma, and some Dhamma Gupt, uh, one book of the Dhamma Guptakas as well. Uh, okay, so let's, have, uh, let's move on a little bit. We're probably spending a bit much time here, so let's see what happens. Then we have uh, other suttas, so we have in the uh, as I mentioned before, there are very few early suttas available in Tibetan language, uh, but there are some, uh, and they are often quoted in other books, for example, of, uh, of the... Uh, uh, they're quoted in later works uh, of the Tibetan. Uh, and then you have some Sanskrit texts and texts in many different kinds of languages, uh, uh, etc., etc. Much, much of this has never actually been published yet. It just exists in these ancient things. Uh. So you may wonder why I say all these things. I'll become clear later on, because these things are actually quite important for being able to reconstruct what early Buddhism was all about. So how do we know what is early? Now we come to the crux of the matter here. So, uh, so this is early Buddhism, right? So how do we actually know what is early Buddhism? Which suttas are from early Buddhism? And I think this is very important to find out, and I'll talk more about why it is important later on. So the first thing is the testimony of the tradition. What does that mean? It means that when you open the, the, the suttas and you read the suttas, it says, thus have I heard, on one occasion a blessed one was staying at Savati. There the blessed one said to the monks, monks. And the monk said, venerable sir. And then the blessed one said this, right? The suttas tell us that the Buddha spoke the suttas. So that's the testimony of the tradition. So of course, when the Buddha says, when, when the suttas say that, then we assume that this is correct unless there is evidence to the contrary, right? It's not as if the suttas are some kind of mystical, uh, weird stuff which you cannot relate to at all. When you read them, they're quite ordinary. They talk about you know, ordinary things, daily activities. They talk about the Dhamma in a way which is easily to un easy to understand, about psychology, about how to overcome anger, etc. It's very easy to relate to these suttas. So because of that, because it's not some kind of mystical, weird stuff, when it says that the Blessed One Buddha said these things, well, you assume that that's the case, unless there is compelling evidence to the contrary, right? So this is the testimony of, tr of the tradition, uh, first one to actually decide whether something is early. When you go to something like the Abhidhamma, it doesn't say the Buddha said this. It just says, uh, on whatever occasion uh, you attain such and such a state, then these factors are present in the mind. That's how the Abhidhamma works. It's a very, very different text. It doesn't even say the Buddha said these things. To find out whether the Buddha said these things, you have to go to the commentaries. The commentaries say, oh, the Buddha spoke the Abhidhamma. But if the Abhidhamma itself doesn't say it, then how uh, reliable is that? The next one is the concordance of the suttas. And this is probably one of the most powerful reasons that we have to know what is early Buddhism, what is the earliest part of Buddhism. Because the fascinating, the very interesting thing is that when you take these suttas that were translated into Chinese, remember, they came from the Sarvastivadan tradition, right? Imported into China, translated into Chinese about the year 300, 400 uh, AD. Uh, 
whereas the other one came from Ashoka's time, went to Sri Lanka. They have been apart for 2,300 years, 2,200, 2,300 years. One in Pali, one in Chinese. Now, if you look at them and you compare them, what you find is the astonishing thing here, that even to this day, they are in many ways almost identical to this, to this day here. 2,300 years apart, translated into different languages, and the core doctrines are in, in almost word for word the same in many places. And that is astonishing. And that gives you a very strong confidence that this, these things which are the same across these traditions must be the word of the Buddha. We only, all we're missing there is a gap of maybe 100, 150 years, and we go all the way back to the Buddha. So if they have been preserved so conservatively for 2,300 years, it seems very likely they would have been preserved in a very conservative way also the 100 years before that, right? So you have the suttas of the Buddha. This is kind of the result of this kind of comparative study. And then you include the Tibetan translations, the Sanskrit, all these things, and it becomes very clear what is going on after a while. And that is a, is, is a very powerful thing, right, when you, when you realize that, because there isn't any direct evidence in the Pali Canon that you can know for sure this is the word of the Buddha. It may have been distorted over the centuries, but here you have virtually direct proof this is the word of the Buddha. It's very powerful. Huh? So then you can do that comparative study with all kind of text. You can do it with the Abhidhamma, you can do it with commentaries, you can do it with any kind of text you have. And what you find is that there's only a core group of texts that are in common across all the schools. And that is what is roughly equivalent to the Diga, Majjhima, Sangyutta and Anguttara Nikayas. So that's how we know. That's one way we know what is early here. Evolution of doctrine. So this is basically when uh, you look at the uh, canon as we have it, whether in Chinese or in Pali, there, there are changes happening, right? There are new ideas cropping up. Uh, and if you read uh, things like the Visuddhimagga, there are many things in there which you don't find at all in the suttas. Uh, if you read uh, late Abhidhamma material, it's the same thing again uh, and one of the best ways of seeing this evolution of doctrine is uh, in a work in the Abhidhamma called the Vibhanga. Now that Vibhanga has two parts to it. One is called the Sutta part, one is called the Abhidhamma part. Uh, in the Sutta part, uh, it basically states exactly what's in the suttas. Uh, in the Abhidhamma part, it talks about the exact same things, the exact same topics as in the first part, uh, but it explains them in a completely new way that nobody has ever seen before, uh, right? Uh, so there you can see evolution in practice. And the Abhidhamma itself admits that one relates to the Sutta, the other one relates to something new called the Abhidhamma. Evolution of doctrine changes over time. It is very obvious when you start reading these things. The Suttas themselves are very self-contained doctrinally. Evolution of language. Again, the Suttas have a certain type of language. You go to the commentaries, it's a very different type of language. Go to the Abhidhamma, very different type of language again. The language is different in many different ways. For, for example, the vocabulary is very different. The vocabulary in the suttas is one way. In the Abhidhamma, they use completely new words. Don't find them in the suttas at all, generally speaking. Or uh, you have the, just the structure of the language, the structure of the sentence, the way the paragraphs, the sentences are made is very different. Um, yeah, so the, the whole feeling of reading it is very, very different. So the obvious conclusion is that one is later, one is earlier. They weren't spoken by the same person, uh, evolution of language. Uh. Then we have uh, political, social and techno technological conditions. Uh. So this is just uh, looking at society as it is described in the suttas uh, and comparing it with society as we know it was uh, uh, at the time of the Buddha or shortly after the time of the Buddha. So again, you can see evolution happening there, changing, changes happening here. And lastly, Chandragupta and Ashoka. Um, the, this is mostly about uh, the fact that you can find inscriptions on the uh, Ashokan inscriptions, which point to specific suttas, point to the pit, uh, pitakas, etc., etc. So these are some of the um, uh, points that makes it very clear what are the earliest suttas, what is early Buddhism, and what is later Buddhism. It's not that hard to find out, actually. 
So it's, um, it's fairly obvious when you start to read these things. But let's have a look at some of these points in more detail, in particular the political uh, and social issues, which are quite interesting. We'll get more into the concordance of the suit, as etc. later on there. Yes? Yes, it's actually on the table there. Is it part that's actually on the table there? There is something in Chinese, yeah. yeah there is parts of it. This, the Sutta Nipata is a complicated text because it is a, is a compilation of many different types of texts. Uh, so parts of it exist in the Chinese, uh, like the Atakavaga, the Parayanavaga, uh, a couple of individual Sutta, Ratana Sutta is in Chinese, uh, the um, Kagavisana Sutta, the Rhinoceros Horn. So many of them are in Chinese. Uh, not the whole thing, yeah, they're individual here. Yeah. So there's a compilation in, in Pali, yeah. It's quite, it gets complicated sometimes there. Yeah. Okay. So, politics. <laughs> um, so this is then roughly what you see here, the mix of king, kingship and aristocracy. This is roughly what India looked like at the time of the Buddha. Uh, there are, is a famous a map of 16 great countries, uh, and some of these 16 great countries were king's rule and others were like a... Uh, almost like a confederacies uh, or aristocracies. It was a kind of democracy almost uh, among a certain subgroup of the people living in these countries. Uh, so that is what India look, looks like when you read the suttas. That's, that's how it is actually is explained in the suttas, right? Uh, and then you look at the reality on the ground. You look at, well, what did India look like, uh, for example, shortly after the time of the Buddha? Uh, the earliest known information we have about India after the time of Buddha is roughly around uh, the time of uh, Chandragupta, who uh, Bhante Sujata talked about before. Remember Chandragupta? He was the grandfather of Ashoka. Uh, he was the first king of the so-called Mauryan dynasty in India, this dynasty which ruled pretty much all of India. Uh, now, at that time, India is completely unified into a single country. Uh, so you can see there that quite vast changes in political structure from the suttas uh, to uh, the time of Chandragupta. Moreover, we know that Chandragupta, we know that earlier kings, the Nandas that I mentioned before, uh, we know that they were all expanding the empire all the time. There was wars going on. Uh, when we look at the suttas, we know that already at that time, the Magadan Republic was very ambitious. It wanted to include other kingdoms uh, into it. Uh, it was already talk, there's already talks about war in there. Uh, so the idea of expansion and, and uh, um, and unification of the north of India is already found in the suttas. And then eventually you come to the point where Chandragupta essentially has unified all of north India. So you can see the evolution there is actually happening. The picture in the suttas fits very well with how, what India looks like about, say, uh, 80 to 100 years after the Buddha passed away here. So again, these are some of the things which shows us that there is a coherence to the picture here. It's not just kind of random or anything like that. Yeah. And this is the, here the thing, the smaller countries being swallowed up by Magadha and Kosala. Uh, these were the two most powerful kingdoms at the time of the Buddha. And the ambition of kings. Okay, this is the uh, interesting little paragraph. This is found in the uh, Ratapala Sutta, which I'm going to talk about a little bit more afterwards. Uh, and there is a Towards the end there, there is a conversation between the monk, Ratapala, and the king that he, of the country where he was from, uh, Kosavya or something like that was the name of the king. Yeah. And uh, Ratapala tries to explain to this king the meaning of craving. Right? What, what does craving mean? Uh, we are all slaves to craving, he says. I'll, I'll show you the suit afterwards. Uh, we're all slaves to the craving. And the king said, what do you mean we're all slaves to the craving? He's unsure about this. Uh, and uh, this monk Ratapala says to him, well, you know, if a man came from the eastern direction and told you, in the east there was this enormous kingdom with lots of gold and uh, uh, silver and jewels and lots of horses and elephants and everything and full of people and all kind of goods, uh, but your army is stronger than their army here. Uh, what would you do? And he says, we would conquer that country, says the king here, right? It shows you the ambition of kings. The craving is always there. You always want to go out. So that was the kingdoms in those days. Was, you know, they had this kind of expansionary policy, here, which later on might, might have uh, fallen away for, for whatever reason. But the very, it's very clearly stated in the suttas that they had this ambition of expansion here. 
Yes. No, it cannot happen. <laughs> now, there, there is the, the original language is actually very hard to uh, to to ascertain exactly what it is. Uh, but the, it's very clear that the original language of the Buddha would have been from the eastern part of India, because that's where the Buddha was from. So Kosala, uh, Magadha, something like that. And uh, later on, the, the language developed because the missions were sent out from Avanti. I think we'll get, probably get to that later on. Avanti is to the west of India. Because the missions started there, the language of the, of the Pali Tipitaka is actually related to that language of Avanti, which is the western India. Western India. But we know very clearly what uh, the language of Eastern India looked like because we have the Ashokan pillars, right? Uh, and the Ashokan pillars and inscriptions were placed in different places in India. And they were, um, the language used in the Ashokan pillars varied uh, depending on the place in India where they were put up uh, to sort of to fit with the, uh, with the local dialect, right? Uh, you had three main dialects in India. It was the Eastern dialect, the Western and the Northwestern dialects in those days. Uh, and uh, the... Eastern dialect, uh, uh, there are some remnants of that in the suttas, uh, but it doesn't look like the Abhidhamma at all. The Abhidhamma is com something completely new, new vocabulary, etc. There are some remnants in the suttas, uh, and they're clearly identifiable by comparing it to Ashokan pillars, for example. Uh, yeah. Okay, let's, let's do a bit of, that's, that's a lot, so let's, let's do a bit of uh, meditation again here. Okay, <clears throat> let's continue here. Okay, so just to remind you uh, what we are trying to do here. Uh, we're looking at politics, we're looking at cultural conditions, we're looking at technological conditions, uh, etc. And the point of this, the point of this exercise is just to uh, see how these things are described in the suttas uh, and then compare that with what we actually know about India at the time of the Buddha. And if they match, if there's a match between what we find in the suttas uh, and what actually existed at the time of the Buddha, uh, well then you have some grounds for saying these must be the earliest suttas, right? This was spoken by the Buddha. This is the point of the exile. Just to remind you, so keep us on track here so we know what we're talking about. It's all about early Buddhism. And there's a nice map here coming up next. And this gives you some idea of the area uh, of these 16 great countries. These are the 16 great countries that are spoken of in the uh, suttas. So you see over here, this is Magadha. Yeah. Uh, this is uh, the area where the Buddha uh, did his early travels here, and then also to the north of that, the Vajians you have there, the Malas, and you have Kosala over here. The Sakyans are up here. Sakyan is, of course, the uh, clan of the Buddha, right? He was born into the Sakyan clan. So this is like the area where the Buddha did most of his travels. Uh, sometimes he went as far as the Kuru country, all the way up here, towards the west here. Uh, so this is his area. And Magadha down here, this is, of course, the uh, source of power for later on for Ashoka. This was the empire that later on gobbled up all of India and also much beyond India as well, Central Asia, Pakistan, Afghanistan, etc. So this is the, this is the source of that uh, large kingdom later on uh, known as the Magadan Empire. Here. So that, those are the 16 countries, just to give you some idea of what we're talking about. So you can see it's quite small, it's quite limited, limited to the north of India, it doesn't really go outside of that. Here. Okay, technology, okay, so this is, I'm not sure if technology is quite the right word, but it's, you know, basically the sort of building materials and the kind of things that they used in those days. Uh, um, so you had iron, uh, uh, the Iron Age started not so long before the uh, time of the Buddha, at that, that place in India, uh, and of course the Iron Age uh, uh, made other things possible. Iron Age was uh, possible because of fire. You, had, you need a certain temperature to be able to uh, 
uh, heat the iron ore to be able to extract the iron, right? Uh, and once you had a control over fire, you also could do things like uh, baking bricks, for example. Brick firing is, is, is talked about here. Uh, and also you could actually do pottery in new ways. Pottery to be, you know, highly to be strong and, and to be polished, etc., often takes a lot of heat. Uh, that's why you have this, what is called the Northern Black Polished Ware. This is a type of pottery that existed around that time, starting maybe 600 BC up to the Mauryan area of about 300 BC, when this was kind of, uh, uh, when this was being used, this type of pottery here. Uh, and again, if you look at the archaeological excavations in India, this is what you find. Uh, you find uh, this type of ware, roughly contemporaneous with the time of the Buddha. You find also that the buildings, you don't find any brick buildings at uh, um, f from the area of the Buddha. The brick building started about the 2nd century BC in the north of India. Again, this is according to archaeological excavations. Uh, and if you read the suttas, there is no, as far as I know, no mention of brick buildings in the suttas. Uh, there is some, some mentioning of brick, but that's in the Vinaya, and that's in the latest strata of, uh, of Pali literature. So buildings were made of mud, right? Mud and wood were essentially what the buildings were made of. Uh, and uh, uh, so that's why you have here wooden buildings. That's how they're described also in the sutta. So again, it fits roughly with the, uh, with the sutta as the way it was at that time. Uh, fired brick is becoming more used at this time, uh, but not yet used for building work, used for other things instead. Uh, I'm going to go through this fairly fast because uh, time is at a premium. This seems to be life. So, uh, society. Uh, we have... Uh, uh, money uh, is described in the suttas. Uh, uh, the the uh, monetary unit in those days was called the kahapana. And the kahapana you find in the suttas, you also find money in archaeological excavations, also kahapanas. Uh, uh, the, if you read some of the um, scriptures that existed before Buddhism, and the most useful ones are the what is known as the Upanishads. And the Upanishads are usually said to have been written down, not, not written down, to have been created uh, maybe a couple of hundred years before the Buddha, huh? and there you don't find money apparently. Huh? In, in those, uh, at that time, usually uh, wealth was always talked about in terms of how much livestock you had, right? Cattle and goats and this sort of thing, particularly cattle. Cities emerging, huh? uh, you start to see uh, cities happening at the time of the Buddha, talking about the large, six large cities. Huh? And again, this is an interesting case study, is the case study of Pataliputra. Pataliputra was the capital city of the Mauryan Empire of King Ashoka and King Chandragupta. And you can read about uh, Pataliputra in Greek sources. And the reason why you can read about it in Greek sources is because there was very close links between the Indian Empire and the Empire of the Greeks. This was due to war and all kinds of things. I'm not going to go into the details. So they exchanged ambassadors, and there was a Greek ambassador in the capital of the Indian Empire at the time of Chandragupta. This is about 300 BC, right? Uh, and he then wrote about his experiences in India. And so we actually have Western books that talk about India at that time. Uh, the name of this uh, ambassador was Megasthenes. You can actually look him up on Wikipedia if you like. Uh, and he wrote about these cities, and he talked about Pataliputra, this fabulous city that existed on the river Ganges. It existed where Patna is found today in Bihar, in eastern India. And um, he talks about this city with large kind of wooden poles that make kind of a big fencing around it, with a massive moat that was 50 meters wide and six meters deep or something, with alligators and things in it to scare people off. Um, and uh, also about the size of the city, 10 kilometers long by 4 kilometers wide. Or I can't remember the exact, but it was a very large city uh, with big towers and all this kind all the way around. Uh. So that we know that for sure. That was what the city was like about 100 years after the Buddha. Now, if you go to the suttas, uh, the suttas do mention Pataliputra, but just as a future prophecy. Uh, and they also mention a place called Pataligama, the Pataligama was a predecessor of Pataliputra. At the time of the Buddha, Pataligama was a tiny village, a tiny fishing village, probably, on the river Ganges. And it's only mentioned one place in the suttas. In other words, it was so small that the Buddha didn't even visit it because it was basically considered insignificant. And it's called the village of Patali, 
Patale Gala means the village of Patale. And that tells you something about the size of this place. So you can see here the massive changes in India at this particular time. How something which was a tiny village at the time of the Buddha becomes the biggest and most magnificent city in India about a hundred years after his passing away here. So you see the changes happening here. So again, we can get a very clear idea that we are in the right uh, framework of time. Trade is limited but growing. Trade at the time of the Buddha was very small. When you read uh, the suttas, uh, the Buddha would often talk about where he got his, cloth, his clothes from. And the best cloth at the time of the Buddha was from Kasi, was the Kasi cloth. Now, Kasi is another word for Benares. So this is like Varanasi, right? Where people go today for pilgrimages and all kinds of things. A very famous uh, Hindu city in India. And that's where they got the luxury goods from, from Kasi. Now, if you look at where the Buddha lived, he lived only a few hundred kilometers away from Kasi. So that was roughly the extent of trade. Luxury goods are usually the things that are traded the furthest because it is the wealthy, the kings, etc., who can buy these things. So this shows that even luxury goods only traded over very small areas. When you get to the time of Ashoka, luxury goods were traded from Europe, from uh, the Greek kings. They exchanged peacocks and elephants and gold and silver and all these kind of things because that, those were the luxury goods that were in demand both in India and in Europe at that time. So suddenly this enormous expansion from being the tiny little trade area within India itself, now they were almost trading with, I mean Europe at that time would have been, there's a slide later on which shows you, seven, eight thousand kilometers away. And with all the, you know, with, if you had to go by boat, which they probably did at that time, it would have been even further because you had to go, you couldn't go in a straight line, obviously. So again, you see this massive change. And this is one of the things that we see about Indian society at that time of the Buddha, just after, just before. There's enormous changes happening in Indian society. here, And that is very helpful for us because it means that we can pinpoint the time with a fair amount of precision here. All of these things show, uh, show the same thing here. Then we have the agricultural rather than pastoral um, uh, economy. Uh, the pastoral economy was the economy of the Upanishads. Uh, this was the area before the Buddha again. Uh, uh, by the time of the Buddha, you have an agricultural economy here. Uh, which is necessary if you're going to have large cities. You're going to need good agriculture, right, to supply the cities with a, um, with a um, secure uh, supply of food. You have store up food, store up grain, all these kind of things. Uh, the growing sense of a unified culture. Uh, so uh, uh, we see at the time of Ashoka, it's one empire. We see the, uh, we see the um, Ashokan edicts going all the way around India, basically saying the same thing in all different places. So the sense of unity was quite tangible at that time. Prior to that, the Aryan culture was still expanding in India. It was kind of moving along. At this time, the Aryan culture had been kind of, all of India was sort of included in that cultural sphere. And then again, you have trade again. Once you have a large empire, you control the trade routes, then trade becomes possible. And of course, the uh, the uh, Mauryan Empire, it controlled the river Ganges, it controlled the Yamuna River. The Yamuna River is a tributary to the Ganges. Uh, so it controlled all these trade routes. That's why it, it was so successful. Uh, okay, geography. Uh, so this is about the known world. Uh, what part of the world was known at these times? Uh, and in the suttas, uh, you see it basically it's only the Ganges area that is known. And maybe we can see this on the previous slide we had before. You see this here is essentially the Ganges area, right? The Ganges area, this is the, uh, the Ganges goes into, uh, the, del the Ganges delta is down here. Huh? And the Ganges goes up here across this way huh? through here. And it goes up to the Kurus up here somewhere. So this is the Ganges huh? So that was pretty much the known world. There's a little bit extra up here. This is the Indus Valley, where the Indus River is. So part of that was also part of the known world in those days. So that was the known world. And then uh, occasionally we also speak of other countries, the Aparantaka. This is the very west of India, north of what today is Mumbai. 
Uh, Kalinga is the east side, south of Calcutta. Uh, and the Yona, these are like the Greeks, either Greek culture or the Greeks themselves, uh, uh, that uh, existed on the borders, probably, of the Indian Empire. And Baveru, according, uh, uh, apparently, is a, um, a reference to Babylon. Babylon is like the Middle East, right? It's present-day Iraq, roughly. Uh. So these are kind of very mentioned once or twice, most of these, in the suttas. And then you come to the time of Chandragupta and Ashoka, and then this enormous expansion of the known world. Suddenly, the known world goes down to south of India. Sri Lanka is included, is known at that time. In terms of Western extension, in the Ashokan inscription, Ashoka mentions four kings of Greece. And these are the kings of Egypt. I can't remember the Greek names anymore, but roughly where the uh, Libya is today, uh, where um, Greece is, and where Albania is, roughly that area. Uh, actually, one of them is, I think, uh, Asia Minor, that would be like Turkey. But that is a long way, and um, yeah, that gives you some idea of the distances we're talking about. This is at the point B over there, this is Libya over here, right? This is where Tripoli is today, uh, and that is the extent of the known world at the time of Ashoka. He knew about the kings in this area. The kings up here in Greece, this area, here, Egypt, compared to the known area at the time uh, of the Buddha would have been this area over here. Huh? So very, very large in comparison here. Huh? And uh, possibly also that even Burma would have been known, it's a bit uh, controversial. Huh? And China uh, was also known soon, soon after this time. Huh? Yeah, so this is just a map of these areas, uh, and you have the one I just showed you before. Okay, so what is early? So what does all this mean? If we do, if we use all these criteria, what I've been talking about now are the different criteria for deciding uh, what is early and what is later. If we use these criteria, what do we come to? Com remember, comparative studies, right? Uh, one, uh, uh, the testimony of the text themselves. Uh, political, social, uh, and uh, geographical situations. Uh, you know, how, how are these things talked about in the suttas compared to what actually is on the reality on the ground, as I say? Uh, um, the development of doctrine, the development of language, all of these things come together, and they basically all of them point to the same thing here. Uh, they point very clearly what are the early texts. Uh, and uh, the most early things that we find by using that these kind of studies is uh, the doctrinal passages attributed to the Buddha in the suttas are basically the earliest part of uh, uh, the Buddhist teachings. And isn't that nice? Isn't that kind of, kind of good that that actually is the case? So when you read about the five, five I was going to say the five noble truths, uh, but <laughs> if you read about that, well, you know you have a very dodgy text uh, written by a, cer a certain Ajahn Brahmali probably. <laughs> so... Um, if you see, when you see things like the Four Noble Truths, uh, when you see you know, the five uh, hindrances, you see the dependent origination, uh, when you see all these teachings in there, you can be almost guaranteed that these were actually spoken by the Buddha two and a half thousand years ago. The evidence is so powerful and so strong. Uh, and uh, that is what you come, come down to. Uh, of course, what you also find is that not, not everything in the sutta as such is the word of the Buddha. The, the, every sutta has a narrative framework, right? It begins with saying that at such and such a time, the Buddha was staying here. Uh, you know, he was, it may give you quite a bit of framework sometimes. And at the end of the sutta, it says, you know, the, uh, the monks rejoiced and, you know, one monk became enlightened or something like that. Now, this is called a narrative framework. It wasn't spoken by the Buddha, right? It's a narrative around it. So that often would be later than the suttas themselves, and sometimes there are aspects of the suttas, again, narrative aspects, or perhaps suttas that are said to be spoken by disciples, spoken after the Buddha passed away, obviously are not part of the earliest suttas. <coughs> then, so that is the most important thing. The second thing is that the Patimokas are early. And this is one of the interesting things that come out of, again, the fact that we have so many Vinayas in Chinese. You look at that, and the Patimoka is almost identical across all the vineyards. It's absolutely astonishing how close they are here. Word for word, quite literally here. 
And some of the other Vinaya material, like what we call the Sangha Kamas, these are the, if you like, the acts that the Sangha can perform, such as ordination and doing various ceremonies, like the Patimoka, reciting the rules, etc. These are also very similar across the various traditions. An important consequence of that uh, is that uh, some of the Vinaya material, in particular the Vinaya material which explains the Patimoka rules, is not actually that early because it doesn't actually match across the different traditions. The language is slightly different from the Patimoka rules. And what that is, that's a very important point of a kind of Buddhist history to understand that because what that means is quite clear the Patimoka rules themselves were laid down by the Buddha, at least most of them. There are some exceptions probably. But the material which surrounds it is very likely to have arisen over time, perhaps over the next couple of centuries after the Buddha. And that is a very important aspect of modern scholarship, that, that particular finding. Because what you find in the Patimoka rules themselves is often something quite practical and easy to practice. But once it gets commented on by the society of the time, which was Indian society, and explained according to Indian norms of those days, it can become very, very hard to practice some of these Patimoka rules. So what it means, if you know that early Buddhism actually was the Patimoka rules and not the surrounding Vibhanga material, it means that you place your emphasis on the rule itself and not so much on the surrounding Vibhanga material. Why should we today practice in accordance with the way things were done in India at the time according to Indian culture? It doesn't make any sense, right? If we know that this was just a kind of cultural accretion that was added later on after the time of the Buddha, then we are allowed to say, well, we live in a different time, in a different zone. It is not appropriate for us to take on things that were laid down in an Indian culture by somebody, we don't know who it was. And this is particularly handy for things like the bhikkhunis, because the bhikkhuni vinya sometimes can seem very hard to follow. Some of the rules, not the rules, uh, some of the surrounding material uh, uh, is, is such that actually it becomes uh, uh, very difficult sometimes for the bhikkhunis. Uh, so, and this is kind of one of the great things about modern scholarship. It shows us where we should lay, put our faith, where we should put the essence of the practice, what really is important. Uh, and it helps us to deal with these rules in an intelligent and, and a, a way, useful way, rather than actually just holding on to stuff which uh, uh, is more cultural than it actually is the word of the Buddha. Anyway, that's, um, of course, it's for the bhikkhunis to decide how they want to practice this, but these are, anyway, useful things to know about as far as a Buddhist scholarship is concerned. Uh, then you have, we have the uh, Buddhist, some of the verses, uh, like the Dhammapada, for example. We're talking about the Sutta Nipata before. Uh, uh, Udana, um, uh, Itivuttaka, Theragata, Theragata. These are, all of these books are found in the Pali Canon, and they're all also found to some degree in the Chinese uh, Tipitaka as well. Uh, so uh, here you start to see a slight divergence uh, with these suttas, which don't belong to the four main Nikayas, uh, there's more divergence between the various versions of these books, but there's still a common core, uh, which we can see there. Uh. And then you have occasional passages quoted in later literature. Uh. Uh, you find that often later literature, later commentaries, they will include passages from the early suttas. Uh. And that's important to recognize that, because it means that even the Tibetan suttas uh, actually can be quite useful to look at because there are lots of quotes and things found in some of the Tibetan commentaries. Uh, you can also find the same thing in some of the Mahayana suttas. Uh, sometimes the Mahayana suttas may quote uh, as something from the early suttas, like the Satipatthanas, for example. Uh, and then you can use that as an early part of those Mahayana suttas. Uh, uh, one of uh, Bandasujato's famous studies on the Satipatthana shows that there is a uh, part of the Prajna Paramita Sutta, which is one of the foundational Mahayana Suttas, has, an as has a Satipatthana passage in it, uh, uh, which, is, uh, which obviously belongs to the early tradition. Okay, so that is what is early. So maybe we will... Uh, let us just quickly look at what is not early as well. So we just, uh, I think that's probably useful. Huh? So first one is Abhidhamma. Sorry, Eddie, I, I apologize for having put that in there. Abhidhamma is on the top. Uh, and according to those criteria, uh, 
that I've been talking about, the Abhidhamma does not actually fit with uh, the early suttas, uh, and it's quite clear that it was composed over a long period of time. It, of course, it has its source in the suttas, right? It comes from that, but it's a development well beyond the suttas. Uh, the Chatakas, uh, again, uh, are mostly stories and things, uh, and uh, it is not, it is quite clear that the structure of these stories, the way this is built up, is very different from the suttas. When you read the Jataka of the Jataka collection, I'm not talking about the Jatakas which are actually in the suttas, but the Jatakas that are part of this massive collection over here, it's about that why the Jataka collection, uh, these are very different from the suttas. Just by reading it, you recognize that straight away here. Uh. And then you have all, uh, all the other books of the Kudaka Nikaya, things like you have here the Peta in Vimanavatu. Again, they are very different when you read them from the early suttas. A lot of emphasis on making merit and the consequence of making merit, for example. Charapitaka is a very different book again. It's about the uh, conduct of the Buddha that was required by the Buddha to become the Buddha. It's ha it, it, tends to, it brings in this bodhisattva ideal in, in that one. The Buddha Vangsa is a lineage of Buddha into the past, and again, quite different from what you find in the suttas, etc., etc. Uh, all of these are very easily discerned as later books, according to the criteria I mentioned before. Most of the vinaya, and I mentioned some of the effects of that uh, uh, before, uh, how we can use that kind of research. Uh, and then you have the Mahayana. Most of the Mahayana suttas is uh, not the word of the Buddha. That's quite clear here. That doesn't mean that it's necessarily wrong, but what it means is that it's not the word of the Buddha. It's very useful to know that. Yeah, yes? Apadana is also definitely late, yeah. yeah. Some addition to the Agamas, uh, including certain verses, etc. Yeah, so basically the point here is that you find that um, when you look at the early suttas, Agamas is just another word for the early suttas, uh, you find that they're not always, have not always been preserved 100%, right? Uh, sometimes things have been lost due to oral transmission. Sometimes things have been added over time. Uh, sometimes the fact that things have been added has actually been stated in the commentaries. This has been added. So we know for sure it has been added. Uh, and then the lives of the Buddha. A lot of the things that a traditional Buddhist would have heard in school uh, uh, is from these legendaries and mythological th um, books that arose after the, long after the time of the Buddha. This is what is meant here by the lives of the Buddha. Okay, let's do a bit more meditation. Okay, let's uh, <coughs> start up again here. Very short meditations, but... <laughs> Okay, so now comes the, the best part of this. This is now going into the suttas themselves. This is what I find really the most interesting thing, but it's nice to have the background information for why the suttas are so useful, of course. So we are continuing here on the Buddhist history, and of course an important part of Buddhist history is precisely the life of the Buddha, right? This is obviously a foundational part uh, of Buddhist history here. Uh, and uh, when you read about the life of the Buddha, as I mentioned before, uh, very often it is more mythology and legend than actually it is, if you like, factual information about who the Buddha was. Uh, and if you want to find the factual information, obviously the best place to go is to ask well, what the Buddha said about his own life. Uh, and there are a number of suttas, and these are part of the early suttas, where the Buddha does speak of his own life. And one of those suttas was another text that was on the, uh, the reading list for, this, uh, for today, Majjhima Nikaya 26, where the Buddha talks about his, uh, his past life. And very often you will find that these suttas are just fragments, right? Uh, the Buddha talks a little bit about how he practiced in those days uh, to give us a sense of guidance of how we should practice. Uh, he uses his life as an example for us, what we should be doing. Uh, so he only pulls out small fragments. It wasn't coherent. It wasn't a full story. Uh, 
And only after the Buddha died did people start to feel, wait a minute, you know, who was this man that we had so much faith in? Her? And then, because of a sense of loss or whatever, the Buddha isn't there anymore, they start to build up the famous Buddha biographies uh, that now are very well known. So when you read a kind of a Buddha biography, uh, then it's often these kind of stories and legends that came afterwards. Uh, so the bare bones that we found in the suttas is actually much less. Uh, one aspect of this is the Jataka tradition. Uh, the Jatakas are all about the past lives of the Buddha. It ties in with the idea of the Bodhisattva ideal, somebody practicing over la large periods of time to become a Buddha. Now there is no reference to that in the suttas. There is nothing in the suttas which says that it is possible to find a path that will take you to Buddhahood. Such a thing doesn't exist in the suttas. There is no such path there. Uh, and indeed, the ideas of past lives in the suttas are very different from what you find in the Jataka collection. In a couple of places, the Buddha does speak of past lives. And perhaps the most interesting one, in my view, of these suttas is called the Pachetana Sutta, which you have up there, the second one up there. Uh, the Pachetana Sutta is very interesting because it talks about uh, the past life of the Buddha in a very different way from what you're used to. Uh, usually, when you hear about the past life of the Buddha, you hear about something magnificent. Uh, some of the suttas, Mahasuddhasana Sutta, the Buddha lived in this enormous palace of gold and silver and jewels, and he had 80,000 cities and 80,000 elephants. And everything is so magnificent that it's completely, uh, it sounds like a fairy tale when you read it. Uh, and it probably is a fairy tale, so it sort of fits well together. And the same thing when you read about the Buddha's past life in the Jatakas, uh, sometimes it just seems over the top. But this particular one, this past life, is very, very ordinary. The Buddha is a cartwright, right? A cartwright is somebody who makes carts, no, actually a carriage ride, or carriage maker, whatever, a carriage maker, cart maker, something like that. Uh, and a carriage maker at the time of the Buddha was one of the lowest professions you could possibly have in India. So here is the Buddha, right? Here's the Buddha that everybody believes in. He has the lowest possible profession, pretty much, that you can have at that time in India. Now that is not something that you would put in there. If you came as a later generation, you wanted to tell the wonderful story of the Buddha, you wouldn't say that he was a carriage, right? carriage maker, kind of a very lowly profession. So this has a sense of authenticity, right? If something goes against the grain, goes against what people normally want to hear, then the sense of authenticity is there. This is one of the ways of actually deciding whether a particular passage is authentic or has a ring of authenticity to it. So he was a carriage maker and he made wheels for the king at the time. The king at the time was obviously a very small king because he wanted one pair of wheels because he was going to go into battle. One pair of wheels, you want to go into battle, that's pretty small time, right? <laughs> so everything is very low-key, everything is very small and very, very simple. So the Buddha made these made this wheels, and he, remember he made wheels for a king so that he could go into battle, right? So what about morality? What about the Bodhisattva is supposed to practice morality to the highest extent? And you see this also in some of the other early biographies of the Buddha, not biographies, early Jatakas found in the suttas, a similar kind of feeling. The Buddha doesn't really know what he's doing. Actually, he isn't the Buddha yet. The, the person who is to become the Buddha doesn't know what he's doing. He's just, you know, kind of, you know, doing this, doing that, just like all the rest of us. It sounds like a very ordinary person. And this is a kind of Jataka, which to me has a kind of ring of truth to it. So this is just to give you some idea of... Um, uh, of what you can find in the suttas uh, uh, as well. This is in the Anguttara Nikaya, the three is number 15, I think, of the Anguttara threes. Uh. Then uh, you come to the present life of the Buddha, uh, and of course one of the interesting things in the present life of the Buddha is this sense of, as it says here, the existential crisis that the Buddha had, right? Uh, and in later literature it's often depicted as the Buddha meeting the old man, the sick man, uh, uh, and the uh, dead man, and then also the ascetic. Uh, but actually, in the suttas, what it says is that the Buddha had the reflection. He thought to himself, well, how can I have aversion towards old age? When I see an old person, how do I feel? Do I feel aversion? I, I, I don't really want to be old. When I see somebody who is dead or somebody who is ill, do I feel, how do I feel about that? Uh, and then he realized that, well, this is part of life. Uh, this is who we all are. 
Illness is just behind the facade. Old age is just behind the facade. Death is just behind. It's all there all the time. And that was for him the spur for renunciation that made him actually give up the world. So a very, very fairly ordinary thing, right? But very profound if you think about it in the correct way. It's not actually about seeing this thing. It's about the reflection you have inside. It makes more sense. It makes more kind of... It's, is more immediately plausible, in, in my opinion, than the uh, later uh, version of this story. Then, of course, based on that, he would renounce the world, right? Uh, and some of the interesting um, uh, little bits you find in this particular sutta about the Buddha's ren renunciation, about the life that he led under various teachers afterwards, uh, there are quite strange little details in there, very idiosyncratic little details. And it has been argued by scholars that the only way those idiosyncratic details could have made it into this sutta is because they must be true. They serve absolutely no, no purpose whatsoever in terms of the life of the Buddha. It is the only plausible reason why they're still there is because they must refer to historical events that actually happened. So again, this is very likely to be history. A lot of what we see in these early suttas is therefore basically shown to be historical, at least in broad, uh, broad respects. Then you have the awakening of the Buddha, very important part of the Buddha's biography, to say the least. Uh, this is really what Buddhism is all about, right? Without the awakening of the Buddha, no Buddhism. If the Buddha wasn't awakened, what happens to Buddhism? There was a, a very a famous scholar, uh, he's actually an English scholar, uh, his name is Rupert Gethin, uh, and he said that all of Buddhism can be regarded as a trying to work out the consequences of the early suttas, right? They are just about working out the consequences of the early suttas. So if the early suttas have no meaning because the Buddha wasn't awakened, the rest is just a waste of time, right? It basically, this is where it comes from. The Buddha's awakening is the foundation stone. Without that, everything else is empty and pointless. So the Buddha's awakening is absolutely foundational. All Buddhists have to agree or have to have some sense that the Buddha attained something profound. He saw something unique. We don't know about anybody else. Anybody else in the, in the rest of Buddhist history, uncertain. But the Buddha is kind of the... Uh, the um, without that, there is nothing, basically, here. So very important part of the biography. And then we have the return. And this return is basically the Buddha attains awakening. Uh, he realizes the predicament of humanity. He knows he has a solution to the predicament of humanity. Compassion arises. This would be the most powerful compassion that anybody can have. Uh, because you know you have the solution to the root problem of human or sentient existence, right? Uh, you know you have that. And you see all these people suffering. Uh, powerful compassion arises. You return. Uh, uh, and you uh, teach the teaching here. Yeah. Uh, apparently this is a very common theme in mythology as well, this idea of renunciation, awakening and return. Apparently something you, you see is quite common in, among traditions. But here we are talking about, as far as I'm concerned, the historical reality of the Buddha's life. Uh, early history of Buddhism. Okay, so that's the Buddha. Now, ah, okay, this is a nice little sutta. This is how the Buddha... Uh, explains his renunciation or why he renounced. It is a sutta from uh, the Sutta Nipata. And um, many people argue this is possibly one of the earliest ways the, the, how the Buddha expressed himself uh, re regarding his own renunciation. So it says, if fear is born from arming oneself, just see how many people fight. I'll tell you about the sense of urgency that made me tremble. Seeing creatures flopping around like fish in water too shallow, uh, so hostile to one another. Seeing this, I became afraid. Uh, this world completely lacks essence. Uh, it trembles in all directions. Uh, I longed to find myself a place unscathed, uh, but I could not see it. Uh, seeing people locked in conflict, uh, I became disenchanted. Uh, but then I discerned here a thorn, hard to see, lodged in the heart. It's craving, right? It's only when pierced by this thorn that one runs in all directions. So if that thorn is taken out, one does not run and settles down. So the Buddha talking about why he renounced the world and why he 
had to give up craving, the thorn in the heart, uh, which causes conflict and problem in the world. Okay, now we come to the Dhamma. So once the Buddha has arisen, he has awakened to the truth, he starts to teach, right? Compassion arises, he starts to teach. And to give you some idea, this first sutta here is basically to give you some idea of how the Buddha copes with other teachings. Because we all know that at the time when the Buddha uh, became awake and there were many other teachers around at that time in India and they had all kinds of doctrines and it's amazing mishmash of doctrines that existed uh, at the time of the Buddha so how did he deal with that uh, and this sutta talks basically how the Buddha tells his disciples to deal with doct different doctrines uh. so first of all is to acknowledge that there are genuine differences uh. in other words uh, uh, these teachings not only do they look different, but they are different. If you practice them, you get different results. They lead to different things. It is not irrelevant uh, which teaching you belong to, you listen to, you take on board. It decides your conduct. It decides the, uh, your rebirth, basically, according to Buddhism. Right. So it's actually important to recognize that there are genuine differences. And I think this is important for our modern world. Too often you hear kind of wishy-washy things about, oh, uh, different teachings are just different paths up the same mountain. Uh, and the answer is no, they're not different paths up the same mountain. Uh, they are different mountains entirely, uh, and often different paths. Uh, so sometimes if everyone is a Buddhist, people may walk different paths, and maybe one goes further than the other one. But if it's a different teaching, it actually is a different mountain altogether. Uh, and the, where it leads you is going to be very different. Uh, so this is important to recognize, that there actually are differences. Uh, and the second part here is the limits of knowledge. Uh, okay, so you recognize that there are differences, but sometimes there are things which are important in the teachings that we cannot know about. Uh, and one of the classical things, of course, is in Buddhism, is the idea of rebirth. Uh, it is fun fundamental to the Buddha's teachings. It's everywhere found in the suttas. Uh, and yet, it's not something you can really... Uh, that most people cannot know for themselves, right? Uh, so you recognize that. Uh, you recognize, you don't say, I know about rebirth if you don't know about it. Uh, you recognize that it is something you take on board as on confidence, uh, on faith, if you like, in the Buddha, because you find, find him impressive. And what he has said so far has been right. Uh, so, okay, I'll take it seriously. But you recognize the limits. These are the two things. You understand the differences. Uh, you recognize the limits. And then what do you do? Well, what you do then is you reflect on uh, the effects of these various doctrines. Where do they lead you? And this is what the Buddha is talking about here. So where does it lead you? If somebody, uh, and the, the doctrines we're talking about here are basically the Buddha's doctrine, which talks about kamma and rebirth, uh, and other doctrines that basically deny either kamma or rebirth or both, uh, right? So this is the distinction. So the Buddha says, well, you reflect. Uh, now, if I live a bad life and there is rebirth, well, I would probably go to bad destination afterwards, right? Now, if, so that is, if there is rebirth. Now, let's say there isn't rebirth. What then? Well, if there isn't rebirth, I will be criticized by wise people in the world if I live a bad life. And that is the same today, right? If you are a bad person, uh, if you don't behave properly, we see that in the newspapers all the time, you get criticized by society for not, being, uh, not doing the right thing. Uh, that has always been the same thing. Uh. On the other hand, the other side of the thing, if, there, uh, if you do follow the Buddha's teachings, then if there is rebirth, uh, well, you would, would have made safety for yourself in the future life. Uh. And if there isn't rebirth, well, at the very least, uh, you will kind of fit into society in a good way, and you will not be criticized by the wise people in society. So either way, you win. So this is how the Buddha then tells you to reflect on these teachings. What are the consequences of these teachings? What do they lead you? Do they lead to happiness and suffering for yourself and others or not? That is the right way of reflecting here. And then, of course, towards the end of the sutta, he then lays out the practice for overcoming these limits in knowledge altogether. And it gives the gradual training that takes you all the way uh, to awakening, so you can see these things for yourself. Uh, 
So the Buddha was very practical. And of course, one of the importances of this sutta is that it fits very well with the Kalama Sutta, right? Don't sort of take things on trust. Try to know for yourself what is good. And then when you know what something is good, then you follow it. So it's like it, it builds up on the Kalama Sutta. It, it makes that more secure. Just to have faith in one sutta is always a bit dangerous. Uh, if there are two or three which point in the same direction, there's more basis for uh, having some confidence that it's a real teaching of the Buddha. Okay, so more Dhamma. So now we come again to uh, Buddhist history again, uh, uh, the first teaching of the Buddha, Four Noble Truths, spoken of in the uh, Dhamma Chakka Pavatana Sutta, the setting in motion, the wheel of the Dhamma, very first teaching of the Buddha. These are especially important because they are a container which contain all the Buddha's teachings, can be contained within the Four Noble Truths. So that's why they are so important. Once you have laid those down, basically the whole Dhamma can be contained uh, within those teachings. Uh, and there are some good arguments that the early suttas were actually collected in a way that mirrored the Four Noble Truths. So all the suttas were classified as belonging to one of the truths, and it was actually uh, structured in that sense. The Sangyutta Nikaya is in, to this day structured a bit like that. Uh, it is based on a rational and experiential method. If you look at the, the suttas, a, uh, you, you see it talks about suffering, right? Uh, suffering is something you can experience. Uh, of course, there's more to it than what you can experience immediately. It's more profound than that. Uh, but at least it starts off with being a very rational, experiential thing. Craving. Craving leads to suffering. Can you see that? Well, if you, if you look very carefully, I think you were able to see that that is precisely the case. Craving is agitation. It's restlessness. It doesn't feel peaceful. Take away craving. Have a sense of peaceful meditation with a bit of joy and happiness. It's the exact opposite, right? We can see that at least the very beginning of this truth. Of course, it goes much further than that again, but at least we can see the start, Take away craving, a third noble truth, you feel peaceful. And then you have the path at the end. And in the suttas, sometimes the medical analogy is used to explain the four noble truths. So you have an illness called dukkha, right? It's the worst illness of all, called dukkha, suffering. You have the cause of dukkha, so you're making a, um, what's it called? A, um, a, okay, anyway, you find the cause of the illness. You know that the cause can be removed. And then you find the cure, the thing which actually cures that, the Noble Eightfold Path. So immediate, experiential, is not just about something, uh, it's not some kind of highfalutin theory. And of course, even the end of the practice, even awakening itself, is something you can experience right here and right now. Um, and, and, and this particular discourse is also interesting because it talks about how Venerable Sariputta explains the Buddha's first sermon. In other words, he gives an example of what you find often in the suttas. This kind of things are contracted and, uh, and, and analyzed in detail, uh, ex or expand and analyzed in detail. Uh, and this is what you see here. And again, uh, the suttas are structured just like that. You have the very simple suttas that just give a teaching. Uh, and then you have the expansion, the analysis of those simple suttas. And that goes on endlessly. And that is what goes on further on in the commentaries and the Abhidhamma, etc., is a continuation of that project. Okay. So I think that's enough. That's just the Four Noble Truths, very briefly, a very important part. Will we? Yeah. Okay. Okay, we, I think we're running out of time. So, uh, yeah, yeah. At the end. Okay. Okay, very good. Yeah. So, we've, we've got a little bit left as far as the, the slides to go. So, we, we'll do them in the, the final session. Uh, I think that's at 4 o'clock or 4.30. So, for now, uh, let's have a break for half an hour. We can have a cup of tea, a cup of coffee. Um, uh, refresh ourselves. And then uh, we'll come back at uh, 3 o'clock. And from 3 till 4.30, uh, we're going to be having discussion groups. Uh, so we'll talk more about that at that time. So we'll see you back here at 3 o'clock.